Well, let's get started. We have a lot to cover, so we're gonna dive right in. Before we do, um, I'm happy to introduce myself. My name is Sierra Bregan, and I'm the owner and founder of Miami Mom Collective. We are Miami's premier parenting resource and community. We host events for moms and families throughout Miami, as well as provide resources that we believe are meaningful, that will encourage, equip, and empower local moms and families. So if we can ever be a resource for you, you can find us on all the social networks, Miami Mom Collective, or our website, miamimomcollective.com. We are thrilled to partner with You Health Jackson Children's Care as we continue the parental guidance series into 2021. We launched this um, last, goodness, it's almost been a year. It's crazy to think of all that's happened in the last year, but um, Jackson was amazingly brilliant in pivoting in the crazy year that we had and taking these educational seminars online with the webinar series. And they've just been hugely popular with our audiences to be able to come to hear from experts about topics that are really important and meaningful. So um, we're just so glad that you're here tonight for our very first episode of 2021. And if you've been around Around, then you um, are probably familiar with tonight's guests. They are becoming a household name around here, but we're so excited to have Dr. Chitani with us as well as Dr. Ophir. Um, you are really learning from the best of the best, and so we're excited. Um, I'd love to tell you a little bit about each one, and before I do, um, I also want to draw to your attention, if you don't know, that um, the a pediatric emergency rooms at the Holtz Children's Hospital and Jackson North are available for you 24 7 so um, if you ever need to visit um, an emergency room I hope that you don't but in these trying times sometimes we do um, I just want to encourage you that the Holtz Children's Hospital as well as Jackson North are open 24 7 they're all staffed with board certified pediatric emergency medicine specialists and the parents and the children are going to get the best access from um, the subspecialists from Holtz Children's Hospitals from the University of the Miami Health System um, and also the Jackson Health System. So you're just going to get the best of the best care there. And um, the Holtz Children's Hospital actually offers a 24-hour kids-only emergency room. So I know sometimes me as a mom, I can be like, oh, I, wish, I wish I could take my kids somewhere that they're not exposed to all the other adult traumas that could be happening in emergency room. Well, you can do that at Holtz Children's. So 24-hour kids-only emergency rooms. And in addition to that, at, um, at Holtz Children's, the doctors and the nurses are certified in pediatric advanced life support. So again, you just can trust and know and rest at ease that you and your children are going to receive the very best care. So um, just a reminder for you there about the emergency rooms. Well, let's dive in because we have a lot of great questions that have been submitted. If you have a question at any time during tonight's webinar, you can use the Q&A feature. We ask instead of the chat feature, uh, just because the chat sometimes gets going, it's easier for us to see the questions in the Q&A box. So drop a question there. We will do our best to get to those. Um, and we have a lot of questions that we're going to go through. So we will hopefully cover all of the topics that um, are of interest to you tonight in terms of the COVID vaccine and other vaccine um, preventable diseases. So this is really our specialty and our focus tonight. So let me take a moment and introduce to you um, our two amazing panelists. So Dr. Audrey Ophir is Associate Professor of Pediatrics and the Director of the Pediatric Comprehensive Care Clinic at Holtz Children's Hospital at U Health Jackson Children's Care. Dr. Ophir, thank you for joining us. Again, at several times you've been with us, we're so thankful. Thank you for having us. Yes. Well, she is um, a faculty member, and so she teaches birth both at the University of Miami. So she's getting the, the medical students and the Jackson Health System physicians, training them at all levels, and particularly in the area of outpatient primary care. So she's delivered many lectures on subjects including immunization, newborn visits, topics that are very relevant. I'm, I'm a mom of little ones, so very relevant things I'm interested in learning more about. Um, her expertise also centers on on the medical home model, which she's been practicing for more than 15 years. And most of her patients are medically complex children. So including those with um, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, Vader syndrome, autism, sickle cell disease, leukemia, and transplant patients. So a lot of wisdom that Dr. Ophir has to share with us. So we can't wait to learn more. So thank you for joining us tonight. 
Thank you. Um, and then, of course, Dr. Brandon Chitani. We're so glad that you're here as well. He's the assistant professor of the Department of Pediatrics Division, specifically in the pediatric infectious diseases at the University of Miami. So hot topics right now, infectious diseases. We have an expert in the house, so we're very excited. He serves as a principal investigator on grant-sponsored research at the Transplant uh, Institute. He's also a published researcher. Um, he conducts regular rounds for the Antibiotic Stewardship Program of Holtz Children's Hospital, along with Pediatric Infectious Disease Clinical Pharmacy. So he has not only doing amazing work in the hospital, but he has leadership roles throughout organizations where um, he is helping you know, to co-chair um, areas of health and wellness for helping Miami youth, which is incredible. And so not only from working to help prevent transmittable diseases, but he establishes say, um, stable housing, his vision, he's just influencing the community beyond what he's also doing at the hospital. So for that, we are so grateful and can't wait to learn more from you. So Dr. Chitani, welcome. Thank you so much for having me again. Yes, we're so excited. Like I said, if you've been with us before, you have probably heard from them because they've joined us several times. So I'll go ahead and make a plug to make a mental note to go back and watch previous episodes on um, jacksonevents.org. So let's dive right in because there is a lot to cover. And what we're going to do, let's start first focus on the topic kind of vaccines as a whole and vaccine preventable diseases. And then we'll transition to get more specific to COVID vaccine. Okay. So let's just begin um, with our vaccines safe. Um, Dr. Ophir, what are the risks and benefits of vaccines? So important question. Uh, vaccines definitely protect against very significant infection. It could be measles, whooping cough, for example. Uh, and these infections can cause a lot of harm, uh, not just to babies, to children, even to adults, ranging from hospitalization, but even death. And mm -hmm. like any decision, I think it's important to be able to gauge the benefits against the risks. The side effects of vaccines are really minimal most of the time. Uh, it can be a mild fever, it can be uh, some soreness at the site of injection, some redness, some swelling, uh, but very frankly, it's usually very minimal. Very, very occasionally, personally, I've never had it in 30 years that I've been administering vaccine, but uh, it is mentioned that there can be some allergic reaction to one component of the vaccine. And of course, we, the physicians, uh, are uh, trained to be able to, uh, to uh, treat that. Uh, so it is very important, especially during the pandemic, even with uh, the protection of the confinement, uh, to be able to make sure that our children are up to date on their shots uh, because we wanna protect them and the community uh, for now and for the future against all these very serious infections and diseases that we have been able to control so far. Right, right, due to the vaccines, that's great. Right. I'm a mom of three and they're four and under. So my baby is, he's just 11 weeks now. So he's little and he's already had several vaccines. So my question is, why do we start vaccinating children so early? Like, is there not a need that we can wait a little bit longer? Why do we do it so early? Well, you know, the important thing is that we have to realize is that we want to start early to be able to finish the sequence and the multiple dosing of the vaccine so that when the child is exposed, and mind you, they are exposed quite early, so that by the time they are exposed to the infection, they have boosted uh, their immune system and they can defend themselves against that infection. So it is very important to start early, actually. Yeah. For sure. And, and you equally remember that babies are born with very little. Babies are learning everything, not just their brains are learning, but their bodies are learning how to fight against these infections. So giving it early gives them a head start, an early start to learning how to fight against these infections. If you don't start early, they could fall behind. Yeah, well, that's good. I want them fighting. So <laughs> my babies are getting vaccinated. Um, okay, tell me about what if my child is sick? Should they get their shots if they're sick? That's a great question, actually. So because it happens quite often. So if it's a mild uh, illness, so let's say they come in with a little cold, maybe even a little mild fever, there's really no medical contraindication and we can give the vaccine in those cases. Okay. If it's a little bit more uh, serious, a little moderate illness, let's say pneumonia, uh, there's still no medical contraindication, but it might confuse the picture. 
because if the child starts to have a fever within 48 hours, you don't really know if it's a reaction to the vaccine or is it the infection that's getting worse? Maybe they're not um, reacting well to the antibiotic and it's not being treated properly. So just because of that confusion, uh, usually okay. what I offer to the parents is just come back in a couple of days and do a nurse visit and get those vaccine uh, and just let them recover. Now, if it's a serious illness, uh, then usually we prefer to postpone the vaccine because probably their defense system is overwhelmed by the serious illness anyway, and it's not going to be able to boost up the titers that we want. So it probably is preferable to postpone the vaccines only if it is a severe illness. Otherwise, usually not. Right. That makes sense. Um, I love what you said too about just the confusion. Yeah. You don't think about that. I kind of just right. always thought, well, if my child is sick, of course they don't need a vaccine, but even just like you said, a mild fever, it could be confusing if you don't know if it's the reaction. So that's right. good. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, Dr. Chitani, tell us why do some vaccines have various doses while others are injected only once? Right. It's a great question. And it has to do with how our bodies respond to these different vaccines. Some vaccines that have been developed, it, it takes our bodies some time to learn and it needs our body to interact with that piece of whatever it is uh, multiple times before it really gets it. This really happens with a few different viruses that we see and we come in contact with day by day. Uh, while other vaccines, you really only need one or two. A, a good example is the MMR and varicella vaccine, what protects us against chicken pox and measles. You need right. two of those and it only takes two, but with two, you have lifelong immunity uh, wow. and, and you really just need those two times so that you get primed and then boosted. Other vaccines, you need a little bit more uh, and you need them a little at a different frequency than the others because your body just needs that time to get used to it and learn how to fight. Okay, okay. I have a question. Um, I noticed one of my children, you know, in getting vaccines, some were like oral vaccines and some were, you know, a shot. Is there, I mean, just any difference in that? Or is that just how a certain vaccine was like developed to be shared, I guess? Right. It's about how it was developed uh, primarily. Okay. I mean, we think about polio. Uh, way back when we used to see polio, we don't see it anymore because of vaccines. And polio was originally, the vaccine for polio was originally given as an oral vaccine, uh, but it was changed to a shot. Primarily two reasons. Uh, one, because science advanced and we were able to give it in fewer doses uh, and have fewer side effects by just giving it as a shot as compared to giving it by mouth. So we are always trying to give the, the product that has the best outcome and fewest side effects uh, with, with any of the vaccines that are recommended. Okay, great. Um, we did get one question from the audience that I'd love to share in terms of this the doses situation. So um, one attendee says that you know their their teenage daughter got one dose of the HPV vaccine about a year ago, but never received the second dose. Is it too late, or should she still get the second dose, or do you need to restart over? Like, what happens with something like that? Yeah, that's a great conversation to have with the primary pediatrician that started the vaccine series. Uh, they can review the guidelines. The CDC, the Center for Diseases Prevention and Control, uh, they, pro they produce guidelines all the time. Actually, they just uh, released their newest guidelines uh, yesterday, actually. Uh, so your pediatrician will review those guidelines and see when is the next best step. Uh, is it good to just start over or can they continue the series uh, as they go along? That's great. That's great. Awesome. Always to check with your, your primary care doctor because no one knows you or your family better than your doctor. So that's great. Um, we love the questions. Keep your questions coming. If you have any particular, maybe specific questions that might be more diagnostic, you know, we may have to the volley it to your doctor, but certainly keep those questions coming. We appreciate it. And we'll do our best to get to all those. Um, okay, another thing. So you were talking about, um, you know, illnesses that have been eradicated. Why do we still need vaccines when the illnesses are, are, have almost been fully eradicated? Well, we have to think about it that all of these viruses and bacteria that we produce vaccines against are illnesses that live in the environment. They live where we live and they'll always be there, but to prevent them from having outbreak and taking hold into a community, 
you need what's called herd immunity. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, especially with uh, when we talk about COVID and what's necessary okay. for COVID herd immunity. But that's why we have to continue with these vaccines as more babies come into the world, because the, those, those things are always there. Tetanus, for example, is in our soil. It's there, it's everywhere. The only way that you're protected against tetanus is that you get your tetanus shot. And even us adults need to keep on our tetanus shot where we get one every 10 years because that immunity goes away over time. Okay, wow. Yeah, that's so important, a good point. Um, okay, Dr. Ophir, back to you, I have a question. Is there a link, I hear a lot in, in the news and um, you know, among people, just the skepticism, like is there a connection between vaccines and autism? So the short answer is absolutely not. Uh, but the problem is this, it all started in 1998 uh, with a doctor by the name of Andrew Wakefield who decided to publish a very small study and a very poor study uh, where he looked at 12 cases uh, who he surmised that uh, after getting an MMR vaccine uh, were more susceptible to get autism. However, mm -hmm. his study had many flaws. Um, it was extremely small, only 12 uh, cases. Uh, there were no control, so they had no comparison of children who had gotten the MMR and did not get uh, autism spectrum disease. Uh, and then, uh, as important, if not more important, uh, Dr. Wakefield did not uh, mention that he was paid by a lawyer who was defending parents who were uh, suing the manufacturer uh, actually producing the MMR vaccine. So eventually, uh, this, this article, uh, these cases were actually published in a, a very famous medical journal called The Lancet. And eventually, once all of these flaws were realized, The Lancet retrieved that uh, publication. Uh, but the harm was done already by then. Unfortunately, right. um, the physician actually got his medical license removed as well. Uh, but up to now, I still have parents who are hesitant uh, to vaccinate their child uh, because uh, they feel that perhaps the MMR vaccine can be associated with autism. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's, it's really important to educate themselves. Please, please talk to your um, pediatrician, talk to your provider to educate yourself. Uh, the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Florida chapter of the American uh, Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC, the Center Disease uh, Control has great phenomenal information on that. Uh, but again, to answer very shortly, absolutely not. There is no link, no association between the MMR vaccine. Uh, and since then, if I may add, there has been several and multiple studies, large studies, good studies uh, that have been done uh, to be able to see if they could reproduce what Dr. Wakefield had done and uh, have shown that there's absolutely no link. Uh, so we know evidence-based that there is absolutely no association. Hmm. Okay, thank you. I had heard that, I think even in the autism uh, parental guidance webinar that we did, you know, months ago, I believe the doctor that we were speaking with then, he mentioned that study, I'd never heard that, but it's just, you know, we got to do our research. Yes. Um, so that's great. Thank you for sharing that with us. I know that puts a lot of us at ease to hear that. Um, on, on topic, but a little a transition here flu. So flu season, is it still mm -hmm. necessary that we get the flu vaccine? Everybody's wearing masks, we're social distancing, we're washing our hands better than ever. Do we still need a flu vaccine? Well, that's a good question. Um, but just to go back to give you an idea or background uh, information on numbers, uh, the year past, uh, influenza caused about 7.5 million uh, illnesses, 3.7 million hospitalization, uh, no, I'm sorry, 3.5 million medical visits and 105,000 hospitalization with 6,300 deaths. So you can tell influenza is a very significant illness uh, and we need to protect ourselves uh, in the pandemic particularly. And you have to remember that not everybody can wear a mask, right? So for example, children less than two years old cannot wear a mask and they are a very vulnerable population to influenza because uh, they actually can get more serious symptoms and get hospitalized. Uh, right. So yes, especially during the pandemic, uh, and because we're also very worried about somebody getting both the COVID-19 and influenza at the same time, uh, we have to protect our children against influenza, no matter what. 
That's right. Yeah. We've never seen, you know, we don't have longitudinal research, I would say of someone who gets COVID and the flu. So like you said, we need to be prepared for that um, as best we can as well. So those flu vaccines are important. Um, Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Talk to us about, you know, COVID numbers are still very high. Um, What about children who are doing virtual schooling? Should they still be sent like, should the parents still be making appointments to go to the pediatrician and get their regular shots? Or should everyone kind of stay home and stay in since they're not in school? So again, here, uh, very, very important question, uh, Sierra, because, uh, you know, obviously the COVID pandemic has made many, many changes in our lives. The new normal now is wearing a mask, social distancing, uh, washing our hands all day long, uh, and staying at home more often. Uh, but uh, the pandemic uh, has caused uh, a really negative impact on the well child care visits of children and Florida right now is at its lowest in its immunization rates. Many children are behind on their shots. Uh, and the problem is that uh, many parents were and still are afraid of coming to the pediatrician's office or the clinic in spite of the fact that the physicians are going uh, over and beyond Uh, to really put in measures in their offices and in the clinics to be able to protect their patients. Uh, So it is absolutely really important to make that appointment, to make sure to get the well visit and to make sure that your children are up to date on their shots, up to date on their shots, I'm sorry, Uh, more so now than ever. That's great. Oh, you hear that parents? Let's stay on it. Let's stay up to date. Keep our kids um, on that schedule so they can Stay safe and update. Yes, yes. the rates are very low and uh, we are all very, very concerned about that. Yeah, wow, wow. Um, yeah, and the, the offices are doing so much to make oh, it, yes. like you said, feel safe and secure and that's great. Um, okay, we received a question from the audience. How do you determine the effectiveness of vaccines over time? So I can, I can talk to that. Uh, over time, we know that vaccines are effective in two different ways. One is that there are studies that are done over large populations to see whether or not an antibody is produced from the individual. So the individual gets the vaccine, then they see whether or not they have the antibody and we can measure exactly how much antibody is there in the body. And we can measure that over time to see how long the antibody lasts. That's one way to know that the vaccine is effective over time. The other part of that is kind of, well, you have an antibody there, is the antibody doing its job? That's a little bit harder to determine uh, and that we more so know just from the rates of infections that happen after enough people have received the vaccine. So that will be looked at very closely uh, as more and more people are getting the COVID vaccine, for example, uh, to see will it affect the rate Uh, after enough people. But I stress that point that enough people really have to receive the vaccine before we're going to truly see that effect. See that data. Okay. Okay. Because I guess that herd immunity would play into some, I guess, as well. Um, Okay. Let's dive right into the COVID topic because that's what we're all really, we want to know. Is or how safe is the COVID vaccine and can our children get it? Should our children get it? Yes. So the... I'll let Dr. Ophir answer this first. Um, So regarding the COVID vaccine, um, I can talk to you about the fact that um, hopefully uh, by this summer, the teenagers will uh, be able to get their vaccines 12 years and older. uh, And hopefully, uh, and I'm glad actually uh, you're talking about this, Sierra, because we want to stress to parents to schedule uh, the teenagers annual visit earlier uh, than usual this year. Uh, Because more than likely the recommendations for uh, the COVID vaccine will be not to get any other vaccine two weeks before the first dose, two weeks after the dose, uh, and no other vaccination in between the two doses, which can be either three weeks or four weeks, depending on the type of the vaccine. So really the best thing to do would be to schedule that annual visit anywhere March, April, at the latest in May, to be able to get those teenagers to get their regular uh, vaccinations so that they have the whole summer to get their two COVID vaccination before they start school in the fall. So again, please, 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 I cannot emphasize enough to have our teenagers schedule their annual visit to their pediatrician 
in the springtime, so March, April, at the latest in May, so that we make sure that they are updated on their regular shots so that when the COVID vaccine is made available to them, hopefully in the summer, they have enough time to be able to get their two doses before they're ready to get it before school starts. Right. Okay. Otherwise, they're catching up on all the other things and then miss the chance to to get it. Do we know anything? Our audience is asking, do we know anything about a vaccine for children younger than 16 when that maybe, I know you said maybe 12 to 16. Do we know anything about a vaccine for younger ones? When that I, I'll let Dr. Chardini expand, but I don't think we know quite yet. Okay. Right. So the studies primarily in the United States and in the UK are focusing on the age group of 12 and up. The reason for that is because of how serious COVID has been seen in that age group. We want to protect them first. The age group that's younger than five, I'm sorry to say they're going to be lower on the priority just because they don't get as sick and they don't transmit it as much as the older kids. Now, I will say that six to 12 age group, the gap that I left there, uh, there are some studies in Europe that are ongoing. Uh, if they prove effective and safe, they'll be brought over to the United States and we'll see a, a rather quick turnaround for approval there. But like Dr. Ophir said, the initial approval is going to be for down to 12 years, so 12 years and up, uh, and then we'll see the age uh, lower after that. Okay, so down to 12 years. Okay, 12 and up, and maybe as soon as summer. So again, the reminder, stay on schedule with your children's vaccine so that they're ready when that time does come to be able to, to be vaccinated before you know summer sports and school begins again and all that. Okay, that's great. That's great. Um, I think you, you spoke a little bit about this, but Dr. Ophir, about how far they should space out the COVID vaccine from your other vaccinations. I think you, you added, you know, is there anything you'd like to add on that? But I think you touched on that for us. So again, uh, two weeks prior to the dose of COVID and two weeks after that dose, uh, it is not recommended to get any other vaccine. Okay. And in between the two doses, no vaccination either. So if you think about it, you have really about eight weeks. Uh, yeah, about two months. Yeah. So that's why it's really important to get the other shots, um, you know, kind of taken care of in the spring, because you're going to have two months in the summer where you have to really complete the, the, uh, the doses of COVID uh, before they start school. So better to, to take care of the regular routine vaccination first. Okay. That is really, really helpful information. Cause I, I just thought honestly, like, okay, when it's available, you know, mm -hmm. sign up and go get it. But no, there's, yeah. there's the strategy there and, and the wisdom and, right. and the, and, and remember, right. And, and just, if I may add, remember that those other vaccines are very important. Uh, they're necessary to be able to get that vaccination sheet to get in school. I would uh, say to even go to school. COVID, right. And obviously the COVID is important for their own protection. Uh, but the other vaccines are actually necessary to get into, into school as well. Okay, great, great, thank you. All right, Dr. Chitani, tell us how does the COVID-19 vaccine work and what are potential side effects and what can be done you know, to mitigate if there are side effects? All right, that's, that's a big question, but we'll question. try and tackle it. <laughs> we're like, this, okay, we're diving in, in for real. <laughs> All right, so there are many different types of vaccines that you'll hear, of, that you'll listen about. Uh, and the ones that are most common and the ones that are going to be likely approved for children first are by the companies of Pfizer and Moderna. Mm -hmm. Those both vaccines are called mRNA type vaccines. Uh, and how they work is basically they carry a message for our body to produce some, a, a protein, uh, a structure that's very similar to what is found on COVID-19. Okay. So we're tricking our body to produce this protein so that our body then will recognize, hey, this wasn't there before ah, and I'm not here. supposed to produce this. Mm -hmm. So then I'm gonna learn how to fight against that particular piece. Then if you ever interact with COVID-19 after you're immune, it recognizes that piece of COVID-19 fights against it and, and destroys the virus very effectively. What's exciting about this science is that it's producing efficacy, meaning the ability to induce the body to fight an infection at rates we've like we've never seen before. Wow. It's so good. Wow. Uh, and it's, it's, okay. it's really exciting to see this technology work the way that wow. it's done. 
as far Thank as Thank you science, for putting it in terms that we can understand. I try. <laughs> I'm like, I that try. was like the best description <laughs> of how it works. I'm like, I understand that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the other vaccines, I will say there is one other that I should mention, one by Johnson & Johnson. And the other company is AstraZeneca that you might read about. Uh, there's a, a lot of controversy about them. Uh, and we'll, we'll learn more as we go along. But basically, those vaccines uh, are, are packaged in a virus, in a living virus uh, called adenovirus. It's not COVID. So again, none of these vaccines okay. have living COVID in them. This, okay. vi this particular vaccine by Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, they use adenovirus to deliver the message to our cells. As compared to Moderna and Pfizer, they wrapped it in a nice fatty blanket uh, and that fatty blanket gets swallowed up by our cells so that the message gets to them uh, to, to produce the protein that we need to fight against. Okay, wow. For yeah, side effects. So uh, I am someone that has received the COVID vaccine. I received okay. both doses of the Pfizer vaccine. I, uh, I can it. tell you I had little to no side effects with both doses. A little arm pain, which quite honestly, we all have a little arm pain after vaccines. It lasted no more than a day, and then I was fine. Uh, okay. Those are the most typical side effects that we've seen in reports. Uh, you know, there's a large number of medical providers that now have been vac vaccinated, and they've all reported their side effects. And really, the, you have to look at the large majority. What is the large majority of people experienced? And most of it is some arm pain, maybe some headache, some tiredness, again, for one day. And then after that, two weeks later, you're immune. I think, I think that's pretty worth it to be immune after that. Wow. Talk to me about, and maybe we're going to get to this, but we're, the, flood, the questions are flooding in now. So we're, we're, we're touching on what people really want to know. But we were speaking earlier about like, how do you know the, you know, the efficacy in the long run of vaccine? Like, is there an anticipated duration for the COVID vaccine immunity? Like, do we know once I've got my two doses, because obviously, you know, hasn't been out for forever. So do we know about how long like we would have immunity for it? Or is it something that could be needed annually? Do we know that yet? we don't know the exact number for that just yet because we're still testing people now hey do you still have the antibody or not right uh, so that's that's the, and they're just and they're still vaccinating people like right now so that's right. that's what we're getting some of those numbers will come in as we as we go along remember the vaccine wasn't available at the start of the pandemic so we're kind of lag behind when we right. when the first vaccine was given right it is hard to believe that you know a year ago, we were kind of all doing life as normal as we thought. And then it was only a few short weeks later, everything changed. But now here we are less than a year and there's a vaccine already. We're talking about vaccines for it, you know, so it's quite amazing. Um, back to the, the question about the teens and children. Will they also require two doses? They, they should. Yes. Uh, the, the platform that they're using currently in testing uh, is for two doses. And again, it's just it's about... And our immune system kind of works that way where it gets primed and then it gets boosted. So okay. the initial meeting, the first date that you get with COVID, and then after that, you really get to know the family and friends, then we'll, we'll be able to fight against it best. Great. Great, great. So many questions coming in. We're going to, you know, we have a lot of questions that, that we're going to, we're going to get to and we're going to take the audience questions. So I'm trying to intersperse those in as they are relevant to our existing conversation. Now, both Dr. Chitani and Dr. Ophir, now both of you work, um, you know, highly involved with transplant patients. We did have someone uh, leave a question that their daughter is a multivisceral transplant patient. She's seven years old. So they haven't left the house in over a year. And they want to know, like, are we exaggerating or can we start doing Doing things with masks and social distancing. And then also if her mother, you know, the grandmother has received her second dose of the COVID vaccine, can they like invite her into their home now? Like, is that something you can speak advice to? Or that's, that's very specific information. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would definitely have, I mean, if you're, if your daughter had a transplant, they must have a transplant team that surrounds her. Yeah. Uh, and one of them should be infectious disease specialists such as myself. <laughs> so I would definitely book an appointment so that you can get all of your questions answered uh, for what's safe uh, for your daughter, because it, it's very variable. 
Uh, it depends on her immunosuppression, what her T cell counts are, what's her history. And that's all the stuff that I review for when I see patients like this in my clinic. I do have a clinic uh, and it's for transplant patients. So please, if, if you have questions specific about, about uh, kids, then we can book that and, and we can have that discussion. That's great. Yes, book an appointment <laughs> for sure. And then you could sit down and ask all those specific questions to um, your family's needs. So great. Okay, well, let's keep going. I want to know, is it safe to take Tylenol, Advil, other painkillers or anti-inflammatory medicines before and after the vaccine? So if you look at the CDC and the WHO guidelines, they do not really recommend uh, either of them as a preventive uh, medication. But certainly if the child has a fever after that or um, pain, then they can take Tylenol. Um, I don't know, Dr. Chetani, you wanted to comment further on that, but um, not as a preventive, but certainly therapeutic, um, it can be used. Right, I, I would stay away from ibuprofen, uh, honestly, just that the, the research so far indicates that it can cause some issues. We'll leave it at that. Tylenol on the other hand has been shown to be fine. It doesn't interfere with the immunity that you get. Uh, and if, if, you're, if you're in pain, it can help alleviate that for the short period of time that, that the pain may be there. Okay, could any of those lessen the effectiveness of the vaccine in any way? There's some suggestions that, that some might, uh, okay. but it's not firm, like hard data just yet. That's why I'm sharing right. it in that way. Right. Uh, but Fair I would enough. say that's why the recommendation stay, stands at acetaminophen or, or we call it Tylenol. Tylenol, right. Okay. Now, what about if someone's already had COVID, do they need the vaccine? Like I already had it, I've got it, who cares? Like, do they still need the vaccine? Short answer is yes. Yeah. And the reason is, is because, again, that it's that first meeting, you had that first meeting with COVID, I'm so sorry, and I hope you're okay. Yeah. Uh, but you need at least that second meeting to really have a robust immune response. Uh, I know, we also have questions on board of, of like the different strain that's out there. Uh, and we're also learning that the way that you respond to COVID is di to the actual infection is different than how we respond to the vaccine. That the vaccine, because of how it's kind of tricking your body into something, um, has a little bit more flexibility in what you're immune against and what you're protected against. And so that's right. why the, the protection is, is really understood uh, and really relied upon from the vaccine as compared to just getting the, the disease. Right. So okay. if I may add, though, I think this is another situation where we need to ask our own provider because the timing of the vaccination is important for somebody who had the infection. So they need to be able to consult their provider. Perhaps that provider wants to run antibodies. Uh, depending on the timing of the infection, um, they may need to be on a different schedule than somebody who did not get the infection. Okay. Great. No, thank you for adding that. That's so great. Um, Dr. Ch Chatani, I believe you spoke to this earlier, but but clarify it again for me because I've already forgotten, but how quickly after getting you know both doses of the vaccine, will I be protected? And then I know you said as far as how long it will last, we're still learning that, but how long after I get it, will I be protected? So it's two weeks after the second dose is the earliest that you'll truly see vaccine response and antibody and a good level of antibodies on board. I have a few patients that have seen it takes a little bit longer, outwards of four weeks, uh, but usually within that two to four weeks after the second dose, a good antibody response has been provided. Okay, great, great. Now, I have um, an 11-week-old, so I'm breastfeeding. Should I get the COVID vaccine while I'm breastfeeding or should I wait? So it's a good question. And unfortunately, we don't really have studies uh, that really show whether it's safe, not safe. We have to remember that the, the COVID vaccine, just as Dr. Chetani mentioned earlier, is not a live vaccine. So it is not a, a dangerous vaccine in that way. You're not going to pass it on to uh, the baby through your milk or anything like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So overall, uh, the CDC is recommending for uh, mothers breastfeeding or not to go ahead and, and get the vaccine. But we can't really say that we have actually studies uh, showing it. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. What about for pregnant moms? Is, would it be the same sort of advice or? 
So yeah, that's another important question. And again, here, we don't have really studies uh, showing that uh, in humans, in mothers uh, who are pregnant, whether it's safe or not. But what we do know is that um, definitely pregnancy heightens the intensity of the COVID symptoms and the COVID infection. Right, right. Uh, but not only that, uh, so the, the, the pregnant women are at a higher risk uh, in the population to get severe COVID-19 uh, disease and therefore would be an argument towards for them to receive the vaccination. The other thing is they unfortunately are at a higher risk to get a negative uh, uh, um, effect of their pregnancy, such as um, prematurity, for example. So right. for those arguments, yes, it is recommended for a right. pregnant woman to get vaccinated. Exactly. It's always benefit and risk. Exactly. Right. Right, right. Okay. And there are, I, I may mean, want to add, I, I mean, there are studies um, in vitro, so in animals, and so far uh, there haven't been any um, negative consequences. And during the, the Pfizer and the Moderna's um, studies, there have been women who got pregnant just unplanned. And so they are following those women very closely to see if they uh, have been having any adverse effects uh, or their babies. And so far, uh, nothing has been reported negatively. Okay. Yeah, it hasn't been long enough for some of them to give birth yet. Correct. So we'll, we'll find out more about that. Uh, right. But I will mention and add to that, that ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, those baby docs that are delivering babies out there, they all got together nationwide and advocated that doctors, if a mother chooses, if a pregnant mother chooses that she wants the COVID vaccine when it becomes available, uh, that doctors don't stand in their way. That, that they have the right to choose to want that uh, and, and to understand understanding the risks and benefits that are there. Um, so right. we shouldn't stand in their way. Right, right. Got that mama instinct in us. So sometimes we have to listen to it, whatever it's telling us at times, you know? So um, no, this is great advice and thank you. It's, it's great to hear coming from just credible sources who you you've both been in this for a long time you've studied this um you know you're at the the cutting edge of, of the research as it's coming out as well and so obviously it's a very hot topic because the questions are flooding in i'm doing my best to get to all of them we might be here all night no i'm teasing uh, we are going to do our best to, to round out here in the next about 15 minutes so if you have a question get it out there now and i will do my very best to get them in front of dr Chitani and dr ophir so many great questions here's another one um, okay, so this, this question says our teenagers are very eager to get back into their football, basketball leagues and whatnot. Um, and this person says, you know, the leagues are a little bit overzealous in their opinion to get back and offering mask free practices, assuming the teens get vaccinated first, like you said, maybe come this summer, can they carry still like COVID back to older and younger family members? So it's something that we're still learning about of how the vaccine affects transmission. We know that it, it reduces the disease that an individual can get, but we're still learning about how it reduces the transmission to another person. So mm -hmm. to be clear, you can still get COVID after getting the vaccine. It just is much, much less likely that it'll kill you. Right. Remember, we're trying to reduce mortality because of right. how deadly this virus has proven to be. That being said, as we learn more, those reports will come out and we'll, we'll probably have another webinar with more information at that time. Yeah. Uh, so I would say that even after getting the vaccine, the recommendations will likely still be wearing a mask and, and having that social distancing. A lot of those same protocols that we have in place now will still be there even after vaccine has been given. Okay, because you still technically probably could transmit it. Is that correct? Correct. So that's what we're still finding out. Yeah. Okay, Correct. great. Yeah. These questions, people are asking that specific question. So, okay. Good to know. Good to know. All right. Here's a question that came in from a mom. I've heard this too. So I want to hear what you think, but you know, this mom says that I feel like this is probably a myth that needs to be dispelled, but we can't help but be fearful as moms of daughters, but there's been rumors that the vaccine could affect a woman's, you know, ability to become pregnant. Is that, is that something that we have research on or we know more about or we're just not sure yet anything you can speak to that 
So I, I also heard this, this rumor, uh, and actually I heard it in, in other terms as well about how it could affect male fertility. Uh, and I can speak to that, it's, it's been very well debunked. I mean, just like as Dr. Ophir said, there were, uh, in the, there were women that got pregnant after having uh, COVID and after having uh, the vaccine. And so it, it, it clearly doesn't have such a, a large effect that it causes that. So yeah, that, that was studied. Um, and, and it was proven wrong. Okay, great. Okay, great. Um, I love it. We're, we're getting so many questions, but we got one that just said, please, another webinar, maybe about another <laughs> one in the summer. So we know it. <laughs> Don't worry, we're going to keep you informed. So stay connected. We will keep these coming. Um, yes, this information is so good and helpful. Um, okay, Dr. Ophir, talk to us about, can we be a little less strict with distancing and wearing a mask after we've had our two doses of COVID vaccine? Short answer, absolutely not. Uh, just as Dr. Chetani <laughs> mentioned. <gonna> that. <laughs> <laughs> just, just as Dr. Chetani mentioned. So even though the Pfizer and Moderma, uh, which have been really the, the vaccines that have been around, uh, have a, a great efficacy. I mean, it protects up to 95%. So these are great vaccines, but none of the vaccines are 100%. So for that first reason, first of all, uh, and then you have to think about the fact that now we're seeing some variants and mutations of the vaccine. So this is not the time to put our guards down. Absolutely not. The CDC has been adamant about that. We need to keep our masks on. We need to keep social distancing and washing our hands. Very, very important, even if we have two doses of the vaccine. Okay, that's great. That was my next question was about this new variant, the mutation. Should we be worried about this? Does the vaccine, is it going to also cover me for that? Or what do we know about that? So the UK variant is a very real thing. And uh, we should have some concern about it. We should be worried about it. It's here in Florida. This isn't like a far off thing that's on another continent. No, it's here where they've identified upwards of 50% of some of the isolates now are this new variant. What we know about the new variant, it's hyper transmittable, meaning it's very, it's more easily transmitted than the virus we were experiencing before. Uh, and wow. we've, wow. I've heard both reports that it causes serious disease and not so serious disease uh, as, as we've seen in the, the previous COVID, strain yeah. that we experienced here on the East Coast. Right. The, I spoke a little bit to that the vaccine, it has been suggested that the vaccines that are currently on market may produce some immunity that protects you against the new variants. Um, Dr. Fauci just went on uh, recently at, at Jackson Memorial. So we've really got the best experts coming and talking to us. Wow, uh, wow. He came and talked to us about that they're in the works of developing a more universal vaccine. Uh, that's going to cover any mutations that come up. And really what he's saying in that is that when we make a vaccine, we focus on a particular piece of the, of the virus. Mm -hmm. And we want to focus on a piece of the virus, one that's available for our immune system to fight against. So it can't right. be deep, deep into the middle of it. It has to be something on the outside. And then two, it's something that the virus doesn't often change. Uh, and so there are pieces of the virus that stay true no matter what happens to it. Uh, right. So we're trying to find that right piece that, that we need to build the vaccine against. Okay. Wow. There's just so much. It's just, there's so much <laughs> to the whole thing and, and, and always so much more developing. So this is just so helpful. We're so grateful for all the wisdom that you're sharing. Um, a few more questions from our audience. Um, again, we don't really know anything yet. I know you said 12 and up for the vaccine um, is kind of where they're focused on. Maybe in the summer, there's no real timeline, I guess, we know of for those 12 and younger, correct? No. I think there's no. a, a 6 to would... 12 in Europe, right, Dr. Chetani? Well, in Europe, they have down to six. They have, six, a, right? they have a study, yeah. a singular study that's looking down to six. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But for timeline purposes, I wouldn't hold my breath for, for the summertime for that young. Right. Uh, but 12, there, there's high hopes that, that the age range will change down to 12 by summertime. Okay. Yeah. Great. Right. The rest will be um, just a guessing game. So 
we don't right. want to do that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we can't really provide you that tangible information here tonight. So we can all just hope and pray for the best here soon. Um, some questions that I'm seeing coming in that maybe some people missed earlier, but um, again, confirming that, that the teenage vaccines, they will also require two doses. And so a great point that Dr. Ophir made is be sure to stay up to date on your children's regular vaccines because that eight week window of where you can't have vaccines in between the, the COVID vaccines. So just keep your child updated so that when it does become available, you are ready. So um, someone said, do you think that the COVID vaccine could be mandatory by a specific age group at a specific age group? I guess, you know, maybe in like, when I take my children to the pediatrician, they suggest this, this, and this, like by a certain age, is that, is that something that could be mandatory at some point? I don't it's probably think it's too early to tell. No? What do you think? Dr. Yeah. I think it's no, too I early. Don't, I don't think it'll be mandated. It right. will be highly recommended. To yeah. keep your child safe but I, right. I don't think as far as like who mandates things it's it's like schools mandate things right um, we have no control of what policies they're going to produce going into right. the next school year but uh yeah I, I highly doubt they're going to mandate it right yeah great um okay and then you spoke already to this but if parents are vaccinated and exposed to covid you can still get covid with the vaccine the point is like you said it's just very it's very much going to decrease the likelihood that you're going to be more hospitalized or death or it's going to make all those um you know a less a lesser case of it we would say kind of like i guess with our flu vaccines you always say if you get the flu vaccine you probably you still could get the flu but hopefully it will be less intense so so it still can be um, transmitted or passed to our, our family and those that we love. So um, all good things to know. Okay, I'm scrolling through the questions here. So okay. many okay. good ones. Well, you scroll, um, I think it's like a, a, a coffee filter. You know, you, you put, yeah. everybody drinks coffee in South Florida. So you put the coffee filter on yeah. and then if you get a like dollar store one, there might be some coffee grains that go through the filter. Uh, so you still got the, the grains right. there. Uh, so you do everything possible to, if you do everything possible to not get the grains down so that you get the best filter, you can put two filters on, meaning that you have the vaccine and you have your mask and other and your social distancing, and that will get you the purest, sweetest coffee at the end of, of, of mixing it all together. So do the best that you can to, to keep yourself safe. <laughs> now we're nice all analogy. Like, oh, now we yeah. want coffee. Nice analogy. I like that. <laughs> Very Miami style. Speak to us in cafecito, and we understand, Dr. Chitani, you're speaking our language. <laughs> um, how would you advise families of where they can go to get information um, about when, like, the vaccines would be available? Like, is that is there a certain place that people need to go to get that information, or just kind of stay tuned for when things come available? I think the CDC, which I think we're going to have on the screen at the end, Center for Disease Great. Control, American Academy of Pediatric, and the Florida chapter of the American Academy of Pediatric, um, I usually are the three sources that I recommend or references that I, re that I recommend to my patients. Great. For sure. For sure. I, I completely agree. Awesome. Awesome. And then do you know anything about like a clinical trial for younger age groups, maybe the six to 12? I know you said that's happening in Europe. Do we know that that's you know, in the works, a trial for that in America, or we have any? Insight? I believe in America, right now no. they're no right in America. They're working on the 12 to 16 slash 18, depending which vaccine. Um, but it, it looks like the next group will probably be the six to 12. But in the United States right now, they're working on the 12 to 16, 18. Great, great. Awesome. Well, um, we're about to wrap it up here. Um, some of our, our guests want to know, okay, how, like we want to know more. So how do we make an appointment? Can they make virtual appointments with either one of your offices? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Both available. Absolutely. And Absolutely. the best way to do that is just how? Um, <laughs> Tell them how. 305-585-6000 three, three is the central number at Jackson Memorial Hospital. Uh, to be able to schedule an appointment with either one of us. Absolutely. Great. Great. Say that number one more time. Sure. 305-585-6000. Awesome. Awesome. And um, many are asking for the link to rewatch. We will, uh, we've recorded this evening. So we will have that up on the jacksonevents.org website um, and next week. So you'll be able to watch it then, share it, send it to friends because this information is, is really valuable. We're gonna continue these um, and we've got lots of topics coming for you. So I wanna go ahead and tell you, please mark your calendars for two weeks from now. So Thursday, February 25th will be our next webinar. And the topic for that one is gonna 
be managing grief and loss. So we all know, man, 2020 was hard for everyone in some sort of way. Um, and, and many, I think, uh, encountered grief and loss in a number of ways. And so um, kids and adults alike, you know, so beyond the fear of the pandemic was just the reality of losing jobs or losing loved ones. So if you would just plan to join us in two weeks for this parental guidance episode, we are going to discuss ways to help your children manage loss from the loss of a loved one to the loss of a pet. You know, that's a huge thing for a child, but helping them walk through that and, and giving you the tools that you need to learn ways that you can support your kids through moments of grief, even and a divorce, rejection, you know, things that they're facing in their worlds um, that are rocking their world. You know, as adults, 2020 rocked our world in every sort of way. So imagine, you know, our sweet children just taking and trying to process all that. So it's going to be a great topic two weeks from now. That is February 25th. So join us back again, will be 8 p.m. Um, and these will be recorded. So just thank you so much, Dr. Chitani and Dr. Ophir for joining us tonight, for giving us all the wisdom, all the great analogies that will help us to understand more <laughs> of a topic that is so daunting, but so necessary for us to have good, trustworthy information on. So we truly appreciate that. And thank you for that. Now, these are some of the websites that they mentioned. Um, of course, expertkidscare.org um, for anything that you need with Jackson. Um, JacksonEvents.org is where all the previous webinars live as, where as, as well as this one will next week. So um, take a moment, screenshot this or write down those websites so you have those resources. Um, and again, thank you to our audience for all of your amazing questions that you kept coming and coming. We're sorry we couldn't get to every single one, but just um, know that we will do our best every time to, um, to get to your questions and we will have future webinars. So your questions help fuel what topics we'll cover next as well. So we appreciate everyone joining us tonight. And um, again, thank you, Dr. Tatani, Dr. Ophir, and the amazing team at Jackson. Um, U Health Jackson Children's Care is there for you. And just a reminder about the Holtz Children's Hospital, 24-hour pediatric emergency rooms um, available. So if you have any fears or, or nerves that something may be going on with your child or in your home, it's best to see the experts and you can do that 24 hours a day um, at Holtz Children's. So thank you again for joining us and we hope to see you all on Thursday, February 25th. Have a thank wonderful you, evening, everyone.